Hey horror fans, welcome back to Room 237, coming at you with another slasher film. Yeah, I can't remember if I've worn this shirt in the video yet, but yeah, it looks like Batman's head's cut off, but Ozzy was here. That's cool. Anyway, I don't know why I felt the need to say that. This is a film I've been wanting to see for years, and I don't really buy movies offline. I don't really like buying stuff offline. And I've had a hard time finding this. Finally just got it just watched it and this movie blew me away it was way better than I thought it was and you know it's a famed video nasty it's one of the earlier slasher films and that is 1979's the toolbox murders which I do own the remake which was I think 2004 directed by Toby Hooper Chainsaw Massacre but it's kind of forgettable it is different and that movie always gets better reviews than this, which anything does, because this has a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. I, I know that's not, you know, what it's not the be-all, end-all of how good a film is, but z Happy Madison Adam Sandler movies get zero. Okay, this, this, like, what really dragged me in was I knew, like, on the cover... I don't know how many times can I say like in one video. The Psychotronic Encyclopedia of Film says the ultimate exploitation sickie. Stephen King G generates some genuinely scary moments. And you know, this is known as one of the big video nasties. It fell into obscurity pretty bad. It is sleazy, but I gotta say, there's so much more to it. Way more than I expected. One, the kills were there. I was like, okay, it's it's not gory, blood and guts like in like a fault chief film, but it's plenty bloody. And it's it's sort of like the kills are in the first half, and then the second half is all tension. But I think it's done very well. I don't know any of the cast. Um, Cameron Mitchell gets top billing. He plays the uh, a head, the lead uh, detective. Pretty much what it is, the film opens up kind of like Taxi Driver. It's just a guy driving down the road, and we keep getting these images of a car accident with a, a young woman, a young girl, that has died in the accident. It's actually weird it's like this weird like freeze frame then it shows her then it goes back and it continues driving and this guy like that's what he looks like he has the trench coat ski mask which he wears like way off so it's like open here but it's uh, you can pretty much see his face you can tell it's an older dude goes into this one apartment the woman recognizes him but of course I think they were kind of going for a jello feel because you know, it's like a down below shot. And he has his big toolbox. And he takes out a drill, which I can't remember the name of the bit. But it's like square with like a point in the middle. It's meant for making big holes. He kills her with that. Goes to another apartment. Um, I, I, I just watched it. I, I was so blown away by the ending. I sort of actually forgot the kills. So that's sort of how... I feel about this you know this other woman she's having some time in the tub if you know what I mean she gets killed with a nail gun oh okay the second kill was a woman in the hallway because it takes place in this apartment building much like the remake does um, she gets killed with a hammer which you know it's very cause, like when he kills the woman with the drill the first time, you get this is sleazy and mean-spirited. Because she's struggling, he knocks her out, then he kills her. When he has the woman with the hammer, he brings the hammer up, we see him, and he turns it around to the claw, get blood, blood spurting. You know, and he kills a few people. But he kidnaps another young woman, a 15-year-old girl named Lori. So then our characters, pretty much for the rest of the film, is 
Cameron Mitchell as the detective, which I like him as the detective. He he plays it straight. He he feels authentic. Like I notice a lot of these kinds of movies, the detective is sort of like a Harvey Bullock from Batman, just sort of like the like yeah, like the toothpick and yeah, we'll see what we can dig up. Yeah, stay away from the press or whatever. Yeah, sure, toots. That might be exaggerated. I've never heard him say toots in a movie. Whatever. And, you know, the girl that got kidnapped, her mom works at a bar. We see her there a few times. Her brother's this kid named Joey. And he's sort of friends with the nephew named Ken, the nephew of the owner of the apartment building. And pretty much all it is, the detective, we don't see a lot of detective work. It's just him questioning some of the characters and stuff like that. Um, Ken is tasked with painting over the blood in some of the rooms. Joey agrees to help him. And they sort of conduct their own little investigation but we then it shows when they go to see his uncle who he's staying with I think they walk out and the camera pans down we see a toolbox and also you can you can see enough of his face in the actual film that oh yeah that looks like that guy I mean, spoiler alert <clears throat> Which, uh, it's not a Jallo. It's, it's a straightforward slasher. Or it's not even an American slasher done sort of like a Jallo, like Friday the 13th or something. And so, yeah. The owner of the apartment building, the uncle of Kent, <clears throat> is the killer. He kidnapped the 15-year-old girl, Joey's sister, because... The girl that we saw in the beginning, the flash of the car accident, which that actually pops up once or twice when he, when he's killing one, one or a few of the victims. He's so traumatized by her death, because that was his daughter, that he kidnapped this girl, Lori, and is holding her captive, essentially. You know, she bound at the wrist and feet, a gag. But... He's very, it's, first time we see them, I mean, it's like a 15 minute scene. It, it feels like a Tarantino scene. It kind of feels like the opening for Inglorious Bastards, which is my favorite thing Tarantino's ever done. And, you know, he's talking, he gives his motive, you know, like, and, and you really buy it. I, I thought the acting was actually very well done. He talks about how, you know, he calls her Kathy, which was his daughter's name. Talks about how, you know, God takes the best ones young, like only the good die young, because then the world won't destroy them. They can die good. He kills people for their sins, and he sees the evil in the world. He wants to take it out, so there's only good. <clears throat> Lori kind of picks up on this and she, like, he brings her lunch. Like, he's very sweet to her, but it's very tense. And you really buy that this guy is fucked in the head, but he's really trying to, I don't know if you call it fantasy or mourning or what, but, you know, she calls him daddy and says, you know, my wrist hurts. And he asks her what dying was like and if it hurt. She says, no, this actually hurts worse. And the girl that played Lori, which you can't really see her that well, but that's actually the last shot of the film. Oh, actually, that's her there. I mean, for those that have seen this, feel free to call me an idiot. I thought she kind of looked like a young of uh, Linda Blair from, like, like Exorcist 2 kind of age, or Hell Knight, which I know Exorcist 2 shouldn't be mentioned. The movie sucks, but uh, I... Kind of thought she looked like Linda Blair. And I mean, this is a long scene. And she's constantly having tears flowing. Her lips are quivering. You know, you really buy that she is scared, terrified, confused. She plays it very well. And then, 
you know, it's basically, you know, just more of the detective talking to either her and Joey's mother or Joey and Kent talking. <clears throat> Joey pretty much figures out that the uncle slash building owner is the killer. He finds a way to the storage room, looks through his toolbox, sees blood. So then Kent starts, you know, he splashes gasoline on him or paint thinner because it was in a drip pan. Um, and, you know, he starts, he says, I have to protect my family. And he does this weird, like, Joey, Joey, burning bright or something like that. And he keeps, like, Clint Eastwood lighting matches and throwing them at him. Finally bursting him into flames. Which is weird because then the next scene, he goes into the bedroom where the guy is keeping Lori and he starts acting like, like, do you know what you've done? Like, you're sick. And then he totally breaks down the killer. He tells him that him and Kathy had an incestuous relationship. So that gets him all pissed off. And, you know, I don't want to give away the whole movie, but it, it seems like one of those movies that either no one's really gonna see it. Like, I mean, I, Blue Underground released it, obviously. They, they always had great releases. So maybe there is a demand for it. I've never heard anyone talk about it. And... Just watching it, I didn't. I don't want to give away the whole thing. I know it sounds like I'm rambling, but you know the ending. It really because by the end of it, it's just Kent and Lori, and he goes to set her free, but he ends up raping her. But here's the thing, you know, he cuts her bonds, tells her, you know. She she says, I was so scared. He starts kissing her. She's like, what are you doing? Kissing her more. She, she starts like being sort of stern with him. He holds her down to kiss her, but then it crossfades into the next scene. So it, it doesn't go last house on the left. But with the music and the performances and everything, it was just as impactful as if they did show it. Because you really get to, you know, feel for this girl because, you know, she was able to pull, I thought she did a wonderful job watching it. I felt bad for her. And, you know, when that happened, it was just like, uh, like you feel even worse. And then, you know, you get the, they're laying in bed together. You see the aftermath, the afterward. And he sort of, he kind of looked like Zac Efron as Ted Bundy in this scene. But he sort of implies that he killed Joey and his uncle. So then she takes care of him. And then you get that last shot. And then there's like this disclaimer saying that this film was dramatized from a true event. Where, you know, the girl was like put in an institution for like four years and moved in uh, I don't know uh, I just got done watching it for the first time and that I don't I, I didn't really care for the disclaimer but the music there is one there's a lot of cool old songs that feel like it would fit but the actual score who did the music doesn't say on here but there, is, during the opening credits, the end, when she's walking across the parking lot and sprinkled throughout the film, there, there's a violin score that I think is so beautiful sounding, beautiful and haunting at the same time, depressing. You know, it, it, it feels like it would be like a big cinematic drama. You know, I, I can't really place what I'm thinking, but... Um, maybe I'll put a link down below for it. I'm not sure, but it it's not a score that you think would be for a, a sleazy slasher film. But it was, and it opened it up so much more. It added 
it added the layers of depth to be emotionally invested into it. I thought that helped out a lot. So with the music, the genuine performances, but I mean, not all the acting is good. I mean, the guy that played, the kid that played Joey did what he could. Ken, you know, when he had to act crazy, he did well. But really, the owner of the building and the girl that played Lori did great in this. I, I was very impressed. Because, you know, he, you really buy this guy's crazy, obsessive, and mourning over his daughter, who died, I think, a year before this story takes place. And she constantly has tears flowing, looks scared, confused, worried, you know, just, uh, I was just really impressed by this. This was not just another... Like, I was expecting maybe something like a, a, the Driller Killer. Which I know I said Abe Ferreira gave kind of a raw, like, um... What the hell was his name? I can't... Uh, a, a, a Joe Spinell a maniac kind of performance. I know, I'm stuttering. I just... I'm just so surprised. I, I, I thought this was going to be maybe a fun blood, like bloody killer movie at best i was emotionally invested in fact the second half with the whole captivity and everything i was at i thought that was actually better than the killing than the murder itself and that's what this movie was supposed to be just another slasher flick but it had so much more to it and i thought it was very well done i i can't recommend this enough if you're a slasher fan, you got to find a way to see it. I'm debating on whether keeping this cover or putting the insert in of the original. Just because I like that too, but I like the dark cover more, I guess. But yeah, so super impressed. Just way, way more than I expected. You know, this is a true gem. Very underrated. Can't recommend it enough. So for room 237, that is the Toolbox Murders. Thank you.